Welcome to this lecture on specific volume, pressure, and temperature. These are three properties we use frequently in thermodynamics, so it's worth reviewing them here. It'll be a, a short topic since you're already familiar with at least pressure and temperature. Maybe not specific volume, but you're familiar with a closely related quantity known as density. So let's go ahead and get started. Take a look at your screen. On the, on the screen here, we have a picture of a barometer. Barometer was first invented by a fellow with the last name Torricelli back in the, um, I think it was the mid-1600s. And he, at the time, people thought that air had no weight to it. And he, he disagreed and showed that their weight did, in fact, have air to it. And the way he did it was he designed a device known as the, a barometer. It's the first barometer that was invented. And essentially what it consisted of was a container filled with mercury. So this would be mercury in here, symbol HG. And he made a, a partially closed tube. So there was a tube where the end was closed on, on this end, and but it was open on this end. And he had, when he put it in the bath of mercury initially, he allowed it to fill up all the way with mercury and then inverted it. So the actual mercury went to some particular height like that. It didn't go, it didn't stay completely filled in the tube. You can see there's a little bit of a gap here between the top and the level of the mercury, but it didn't, it didn't completely drain out. And the reason that the, the mercury doesn't completely drain out is because there's actually atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury bath here. So there's some, let's call it P atmosphere pushing down on the bath of mercury and that forces the mercury up into the tube and that pressure balances the weight of the mercury inside the tube. This is something you'll learn more about in fluid mechanics but it was Torricelli who originally came up with this idea and I think it was Pascal who later came along and sort of did the, the theoretical analysis of it and showed that the height of that column of mercury in the tube could be used to calculate what the pressure is in the atmosphere. And so if that if that height went up, then that means the atmospheric pressure went up. So if you can sort of think of it as you're pushing down, forcing the mercury up further into the tube. So if the atmospheric pressure went higher, the level of mercury in the tube went higher. If the atmospheric pressure went lower, then the 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 level of mercury in the tube would go down a little bit. So you can measure the height of mercury in the tube in order to get what the atmospheric pressure is. Okay, so that kind of measurement is very useful for weather applications in particular. People have found that when you have low atmospheric pressure, that tends to correspond to a stormy kind of bad weather. And you can see that here in the, this barometric pressure gauge. When you have low pressure, so the numbers on the outside of the gauge here like the 28, 29, 30, 31, those correspond to inches of mercury. It's a unit of measure. It's basically the inches of mercury vertically here from the free surface. And so when that value is small, you get, it corresponds to stormy weather. When the value is high, it corresponds to dry, you know, typically good weather. And when the, when the um, change occurs, when there's a fast change, you know, if it uh, is going from very dry and it moves rapidly to stormy, that means you know that the weather is going to change pretty quickly here. And it's uh, it's often windy at the same time because you have pressure differences and the pressure differences result in movement of air. And and so you get a change in the weather and it becomes stormy. So anyway, kind of a an interesting history there related to measurement of pressure, which is one of the topics we're going to talk about today. So let's go ahead and actually get into the, the material. So the first thing we'll talk about are density and specific volume. In thermodynamics, we tend to use specific volume much more than density, but in other thermal fluids courses, we tend to use density more often than specific volume. So in fluid mechanics, we use density. Heat mass transfer, it's typically density. But in thermo, it's specific volume. The two are closely related to one another. So I think pretty much everyone's familiar with density. And the dimensions of density are mass per cubic, mass per length cubed, or mass per volume. So let me just kind of explain what you're looking at here. When I put square brackets around the symbol, so row here represents density, and the square brackets around it means dimensions of. And what I mean by dimensions, it's like the physical quantities used to describe that parameter. So density is like a mass per unit volume, and a volume is like a length cubed. Okay, so the, the dimensions of density are mass per unit volume. 
the corresponding units to that, so, so dimensions are the physical quantities like mass and volume, the units give size to those dimensions. So the corresponding units would be like kilograms per cubic meter. So like a kilogram is a mass and a cubic meter, it's like a cubic length, right? So we'll frequently use kilograms per cubic meters when we talk about density. When you use the imperial or English system, you have these other units. So like pounds mass per cubic foot or slugs per cubic foot. We won't use those very frequently. Well, I take that back. We, we will actually use them. But, you know, in a lot of your courses, you tend to stick with the metric units. Now, specific volume is 1 over the density. You can see that here. So we'll use the symbol little v for specific volume, and that's just 1 over the density. That's what we'll use most frequently in this course. So the dimensions of specific volume are volume per mass. So length cubed per mass. So those units will be like cubic meters per kilogram or cubic feet per pound mass or cubic feet per slug. Okay. Now, there are unit conversions that you can look up that convert between, you know, like the metric and the English units. I'm not going to cover those here. Those are always available on, on Google, um, you know, online, textbooks, things like that. So I'm, I won't cover those here. On an exam or quiz, like a time situation when you're in class, if you needed to do those unit conversions, we would provide them for you. Uh, often we'll just have you do the calculations in metric units since that those are much easier. One other specific volume related quantity here is the molar value for specific volume. So we give that as a little v with a bar above it to mean a molar specific volume. And that is the specific volume times the molecular mass. And so the units of that would be cubic meters per kilomole. A mole is just is a measure of the number of items that you have of something. So like the number of molecules of a particular substance. And we'll use that occasionally. We don't use it too much, but you'll see it pop up occasionally. So M is the molecular weight or molecular mass, and that has units of kilograms per kilomole or grams per mole. I have a couple of examples online that you can look up to see how you do this kind of conversion for a couple of examples. It's, it's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go through it here. Most frequently, however, we'll just deal with, with the specific volume with units of cubic meters per kilogram. And only occasionally will we deal with this molar specific volume. So that's it for density and specific volume. So just a quick reminder of the physical significance. The specific volume is just the volume that is taken up by a certain mass of a substance. So if you have one kilogram of air, how much volume does it take up under a certain temperature and pressure, etc.? Okay? So that's one that we'll use frequently. Let's move on to the next one, pressure. I think you all have some familiarity with the concept of pressure. A pressure is a force per unit area. So the dimensions of pressure, and we'll use a P for pressure, is a force per unit area, and area, of course, is a length squared. So common units will be pascals, which are a newton per square meter. In the English system, it's pounds force per square inch, or PSI is pretty common, or pounds force per square foot, PSF. Another unit we'll use frequently are bars. So this is, again, with kind of the metric system. One bar is 100,000 pascal. So that's one that we'll use very frequently. So we'll use pascals, kilopascals, and bars. You'll also see inches of mercury, like I described at the very beginning of this lecture, or millimeters of mercury. We won't deal with those very often at all. We'll, we'll stick primarily with the metric units. So pressure, actually a pressure has no direction to it, it's just a scalar quantity, right? It's just a number, it has, it's not a vector, it has no orientation, but a pressure force does have some orientation to it. To find a pressure force, I'll just refer to this equation here, a pressure force is the pressure times an area, and it, it's, I've written it in sort of a special way here, the, read, the way to read this is, this is a little bit of pressure force, and the, the F bold-faced means that it's a, a vector quantity, so it has magnitude and direction. And the little d just means it's differentially small, just tiny, as small as you ever want to make it. 
and that's equal to minus the pressure times the area. The, the dA is this, the size of that area. So this area right here, that is dA. It's a very small area. So it's pressure times area, and then we have this minus n hat. So remember that area is, I, I think I talked about this in the last lecture video, the introductory one, that every area has some orientation to it. So we have like a normal vector on that area that gives it some orientation. And so you can see the outward pointing normal vector here on this surface is that way. So the pressure force is acting inward, and so that's why we have the minus n hat. That, that makes the pressure force act inward. So the little bit of pressure force is PDA acting inward on the surface. That's the minus n hat. And the reason I did it in little bits is because let's say you had some big surface here, but the pressure varied over the surface. Let's say it looked like that. So it's showing how the, you know, this is, this is the pressure magnitude. Each one of these little areas would have a different amount of pressure force. You know, if I, if I just did pressure times this whole area, like the pressure is ill-defined, right? It varies over the whole area. You don't know what value of pressure to use. Do you use the average? Do you use the maximum? Do you use the minimum? Do you use two-thirds of the average? It's just not clear. It's ambiguous. But if you break it down into small little bits, like what I've shown right here, like a small little bit, if I zoomed in on that really closely, then the pressure becomes well-defined. Over that small area, the pressure is pretty much constant. So this is area DA. That pressure is pretty much constant over that small area. So then I can find the little bit of pressure force on that small area. Let me draw that in red here. So there's my little bit of pressure force. And then if I wanted the pressure force over the whole area, I would just add up all those little bits of pressure force over the whole area. And that would give me my total force. And by adding it up, that's essentially doing an integral. We're just adding all the little bits together. So the, the total force would be the integral of all the little forces added together over the whole area. So that's how you get a total pressure force. Now, in this course, we won't do those kinds of integrals. That's not very common uh, for thermodynamics one. But in an, uh, other thermofluids courses like fluid mechanics, that's something you do very commonly. So I just thought I'd introduce the idea for you here. And I describe all of it in, in the notes here. This is, all, this is all the same thing that I just described, just in words. So you don't have to worry that too much about what I've just talked about with the integral here for this course. I just, it's bonus material, if you will. But uh, a couple things you should be aware of. So when we talk about pressure, there are two kinds of pressure that we, we typically deal with. One's called an absolute pressure, and the other one's called a gauge pressure. Now the absolute pressure is the pressure reference to a vacuum, meaning that the pressure in a vacuum, a perfect vacuum, would be zero. And we put parentheses, parentheses ABS just to indicate that it's an absolute pressure that we're talking about here. Atmospheric pressure, using absolute pressure, tip is typically like 14.7 pounds per square inch in English units, or let's say 101 kilopascals in metric units. And I'll just put an absolute here so it's clear. Normally for the English system, when if you're using PSI, you'd put an A here to indicate absolute. Right, so, so if we're dealing with an absolute pressure, atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals. A vacuum is zero. The other kind of pressure that's often used is a gauge pressure. In a gauge pressure, the pressure is reference to the atmosphere. So atmospheric pressure in that case is zero. So when we write the atmospheric pressure, we'd write it just like this. P atmosphere equals zero gauge. And again, we put the parentheses gauge there just to make it unambiguous that we're talking about a gauge pressure here. And a vacuum in that case would be minus 14.7 PSI G to indicate a gauge pressure or minus 101 kilopascals parentheses gauge to indicate that. Okay, so we have both absolute and gauge pressures. Now, when we use like the ideal gas model or take ratios of pressures and such, we always need to use absolute pressures. Okay, it always has to be with respect to, to a vacuum being a zero value. So be careful of that. If you use the ideal gas law or anything derived from it, or you take ratios of pressures, you have to use absolute pressures. 
Now you might ask yourself, well then why do we have you know, gauge pressure? And the reason for that is because a lot of the instruments used to measure pressure are relative to the surrounding atmosphere. And we won't get into that very much in this course, but, but just the instrumentation used to measure pressures usually measure the pressure difference between whatever it is you're interested in and the atmosphere. And so that's why gauge pressure comes about. So for example, like your car tire, like, right, if you, if you use a pressure gauge to measure your car tire pressure, it's actually measuring a gauge pressure because it's measuring the pressure in the tire relative to the surrounding atmosphere. It's not measuring an absolute pressure, okay? But many of the calculations you have to do in thermodynamics require an absolute pressure, so be careful of it. The other thing I, I recommend you always do, now you'll see people won't do this um, you know, in general, but I, I recommend you do it. Let's get the let's get the movement started so everybody does it. But I think what you need to do is put absolute or gauge there so that it's unambiguous. If you if you don't put absolute or gauge, and I just wrote, you know, for example, pressure is 50 kilopascals, you don't know whether that's a gauge pressure and absolute pressure, right? It's it's ambiguous. Let's just avoid that. Engineers don't like ambiguity, so always just make sure you put in absolute or gauge. A little extra writing, but it's worth it so there's no confusion. Now to convert between absolute and gauge pressures, I give a little simple formula here. It's just, if you, if you have an absolute pressure, you just take that absolute pressure, subtract out the atmospheric pressure, in terms of absolute pressure, and then you'll get the gauge pressure, right? So that works here, for example. If you have 101 kilopascals absolute is your, pre is your pressure, then you subtract out the atmospheric pressure in terms of absolute pressure, which would be 101 kilopascals, then you'll get zero for the gauge pressure. Right? So if I have this 50 kilopascal absolute pressure and I wanted to convert it to a gauge pressure, right? so that's an absolute pressure, and I want to get the gauge corresponding gauge value for it, I would take that 50 kilopascals, subtract out our atmospheric pressure, 101 kilopascals, those are both, so let me uh, highlight which term is which here. So this one is this one, and this one is that one. Then what we would get it would be um, minus, what is that, minus 51 kilopascals gauge. So 50 kilopascals absolute pressure corresponds to minus 51 kilopascals gauge pressure, right? And it's just this simple conversion. Again, you, you don't need to do this a whole lot in this course, but it does come up from time to time, so you just need to be aware of it. So just a big reminder here, always use the absolute pressure when using the ideal gas law or any equation derived from it. Also, if you do ratios of pressures, make sure you do that. And then, I already mentioned it, but if you're under standard temperature and pressure, conditions, atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals or 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute or zero pounds per square inch gauge. Okay. I think that's all we need to say about pressure. Let's move on to temperature. So we don't have a whole lot to say about temperature. Just physically, what you should be aware of is that temperature is just a measure of the random kinetic energy of, of molecules in some substance. So when we talk about the temperature of the air, you know, the air has all these molecules bouncing around. And if you look at the random kinetic energy, so if you subtract out the average movement, like if there's a wind, you would subtract out the, the wind velocity, so you're just left with the random movement. And you take into account all the kinetic energies of the molecules, so you get a measure of the, the kinetic energy of the, that random movement. Temperature is a measure of that, that kinetic energy. So a higher temperature corresponds to faster random movement of particles, and if the temperature is lower, then it means the particles aren't moving quite as fast. The dimensions, of course, of temperature are just temperature. We'll just probably shouldn't use a T. I should probably use a different symbol. Uh, we'll just use theta for temperature. Uh, T will reserve for time. But the units that we use are degrees Celsius or Kelvin. So and then in the English system, it's degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Rankine. The Kelvin and Rankine are absolute temperatures. Okay, just kind of like on pressure, we have absolute pressure that we need to use in the ideal gas law. When we use a temperature in the ideal gas law or do any sort of 
ratios of temperatures, we need to be using absolute temperatures. So that, and you need to be using Kelvin or degrees ranking. Degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, those are just kind of more for our convenience. You know, just every day, you know, what's the temperature outside? You want to tell people in degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. You don't want to tell them in Kelvin or certainly not degrees ranking. But for scientific calculations, you're better off using Kelvin or degrees ranking. You have to, again, when it comes to the ideal gas law or anything derived from the ideal gas law, or if you do ratios. Then I express that here. I also included some help, helpful conversions. Again, these things are available on Google, so you know, or online textbooks and stuff. You don't have to memorize these, but I just put them here for your convenience as well. How you convert from degrees ranking, for example, to degrees Fahrenheit, or between Kelvin and degrees Celsius. The one that you probably want to, the number you want to memorize here really is the 273.15 when going from Celsius to Kelvin or vice versa. That, that's the one number that we do frequently, so memorize that. This other information I have on the screen here is more just for kind of day-to-day uh, -day use, not for any sort of scientific calculation. But since in the United States we deal with you know degrees Fahrenheit, the rest of the world typically uses degrees Celsius, Sometimes we have to do these conversions if you're traveling or such. Um, and so these little conversions here are kind of helpful just for everyday use. 10 degrees Celsius corresponds to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you change by 5 degrees Celsius, that corresponds to a, a, a change of 9 degrees Fahrenheit there. Another way you can do a conversion, like for example, if you have degrees Celsius and you want to convert to degrees Fahrenheit, just multiply your temperature in degrees Celsius by 2 and then add in 30. So just a rough calculation, let's say it's 20 degrees Celsius, then what we would do is multiply by two, that would make it 40 and then add in 30, so that would correspond to roughly 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, if it's 30 degrees Celsius, that corresponds to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not exact, but it's a rough approximation. It'll be off by a few degrees over typical weather conditions. So it's just a, a handy way to do that conversion when you're out and about. But don't use it for scientific calculations. For scientific calculations, the, use the conversions here. We'll say more about temperature as we get further along in the course and talk about the absolute temperature scale and how we, how we arrive at that. That'll be one of the lectures later on. All right, that's all there is to this topic. Hopefully, much of it's some review, and uh, there's nothing too uh, surprising here for you. Just the, the takeaways really are, especially for pressure and temperature, make sure you're using absolute pressure, absolute temperature in ideal gas law or anything derived from it. Or if you do ratios of pressures or ratios of temperatures, they have to be absolute values. We'll go ahead and end the lecture there.